Presented by Caltech. So we're doing simple harmonic motion. So for example, the mass on the spring that we analyzed already. I have uh, over here another one. If you look at the screen up there, you see that that motion looks quite a bit like that motion. Pretty much the same thing. Um, except that what's going on over there is just something's going around in a circle. And you're just seeing that peg through a slit there. So this, uh, I think, is a nice illustration of uh, how sines and cosines come into play. Uh, the motion can look linear, but there can still be underlying sines and cosines governing it. So I just thought that was a cute little demonstration. And I will try to turn everything off now. And remember where I have to go next. So a lot of buttons to push. I don't want to do that yet. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go back to this. We saw it did slow down some. So there's something going on that's kind of affecting this. It's uh, not a perfect simple harmonic oscillator. Energy is not completely conserved. Um, there's some air resistance, presumably. There's maybe some friction with the track that we haven't managed to get rid of with, uh, even with the levitation. It may not be perfect. The springs themselves may have some friction in them, uh, all contributing to this thing slowing down. Uh, but we can actually make it worse. So just kind of watch how fast, how much it's going, and then it slows down a lot faster. And all I did was I put this aluminum bar closer to it. This is just a piece of aluminum here. I didn't touch it. I put it closer. But the reason this nut is on, th this bolt is on this side is because it's holding two magnets on this side. So this has a couple of rather strong magnets, such that if I put them close enough to this aluminum bar, it slows it down. Why? Aluminum is not magnetic. What's going on here? It really is a pronounced effect. So I hope you remember from last year uh, about eddy currents. Or if you didn't, let me tell you about eddy currents. Um, we're damping our motion. Eddy currents. You know, we've put, we've put a magnet here, and we've put an aluminum bar. <clears throat> and why does that slow it down? Well, it slows it down because if you put, so aluminum bar is a good conductor. It has lots of electrons that are free to move about. And we're putting it in the presence of a moving magnetic field, or by some Galilean transformation, we're putting the magnet in the presence of moving charges. Either way, we have a Lorentz force.
This is the Lorentz force law. So with E equal to zero, we have a magnet. We have relative motion between the charge and the magnet, which is V, the velocity of this thing. And so that gives a force on the charges. So the force on these charges in this bar are going to make the electrons move. And so the, the electrons move under a force that's proportional to the velocity. And when these electrons move with the aluminum, it's not a superconductor, it's a regular conductor, it's a very good conductor, but it's not a perfect conductor. They're going to dissipate energy in the resistance of the bar. And so I am extracting energy from this mechanical system into heat, heating up the bar. And that's what's causing the damping. It's just the eddy currents. <clears throat> so let me pursue that a little bit. force that's proportional to the velocity in magnitude. I mean, the force is actually perpendicular to the velocity, so it makes these, uh, you know, it makes the motion of these electrons in the bar be a little more complicated. Uh, but nonetheless, the energy eventually goes into heating up the bar. <coughs> uh, the force on the mass is proportional, however, to you know, because the force on the charge has got an equal and opposite reaction in the force on the mass. And, and so that's uh, force is proportional to the velocity. And so somehow the, the effect of the damping is, is, looks like it has a force proportional to the velocity. <clears throat> so our original equation that says mx double dot equals minus k times x. x is a function of time. Gets an additional force term. So this is a force equation. Which is a velocity dependent force. which is resisting the motion, so it's a restoring force. So we can write our force equation as mx double dot is equal to minus k times x minus a velocity dependent restoring force. So I'll write this as a function of x dot. Of course, x dot is a function of time. So it's ultimately a function of time. <clears throat> With our velocity dependent force at zero velocity is equal to zero. This Lorentz force is equal to zero if V is equal to zero and E is equal to zero. Okay. Okay, and so we anticipate here from just thinking about where this force comes from that that our velocity dependent force is at least to a good approximation proportional to the velocity. So we can actually expect that this could be uh, maybe a common theme, uh, that other velocity-dependent forces, air resistance. Air resistance for slow enough motion is, is proportional to the velocity. 
if I had a, a dash pot with a, you know, some configuration was filled with oil uh, for slow enough motion, that is for viscous motion, uh, the force would be proportional to the velocity. Um, uh, of course, at higher velocities, the air resistance tends to go like V squared. But uh, uh, in fact, it's a, uh, it's a complicated function. But we can extract a common theme for, for small enough motion again. <coughs> um, using the Taylor series again. And let's see how that works. Let's go over here first. So if we consider a velocity dependent force, it depends on the velocity x dot. If we make a Taylor series, it's the force evaluated at zero velocity. Not x. Plus x dot times the derivative of the force with respect to x dot evaluated at zero velocity. So for small, so we're doing an expansion about zero velocity. That's what we're doing with our Taylor series expansion. So in, in general, I would have an x dot minus the point we're expanding about, but we're expanding about zero. Okay. Plus a high order terms in general. And so forth. So Taylor series expansion. I did add a page with a uh, note about Taylor series expansions to my last week. Uh, I think I put it with my last week's uh, lectures, which I think are posted. Um, so let's see. So if there's zero force at zero velocity, this first term goes away. The second term uh, is presumably uh, likely to be non-zero. In, in this case, we have an argument for why it's non-zero. And this term goes like the velocity squared. So if the velocity is small, the velocity squared term is ex expected normally to be small compared with the velocity term. It, you know, Things may not happen quite that way in particular instances, uh, but at least in this instance, we, th we think that's probably right. And, and in fact, in many cases, it's an excellent approximation. Um, of course, if I had just done this, The valve has a leak in it. Let's try that again. Oh, it's a, um, hmm.
Okay, there's another valve back there, but I can't reach it. Let me tell them to turn off the compressor. Let's see. Gotta do this. Let me turn off the compressor. There's a leak in the valve. Oh yeah, it does that every now and then. Oh okay. I've I've fiddled with the valve quite a bit, so. Yeah, oh, that's the one I couldn't reach. There it is. That's interesting. Is it just a relief valve going off? Or? Uh, I don't know. I'll have to look at it. Oh, okay, here. okay. Anyway, thanks. So, okay, we got it off now. That's what I wanted. Um, So now the damping force is pretty much all friction. And it's kind of behaving funny. So when we have a frictional case like this, then we need to do a little more analysis. Things are not quite behaving the way I'm claiming here. Uh, even as the velocity goes to zero, we'll have a lot of force there that's keeping it from moving. So we'll probably investigate that a little bit in the homework. It's, it's a very common case that doesn't fit the, the usual narrative of this course, and courses like this everywhere. Uh, but it's, it's, it's useful to keep it in mind that uh, there are some exceptions to the rule. <clears throat> so let's continue with the narrative that works in many t cases, but not always. So let's see. So to lowest order in V, or x dot. <clears throat> we have to lowest non-zero order. So because that's the lowest order is that, but it's zero. F of V of x dot is something like gamma m x dot. Well, I put this m in. It's just a constant times x dot, just linear in the in the velocity. But I'll put this M in for convenience. And the convenience is to, is to give this guy units of 1 over time. So. Uh, that is, it's like uh, it has the same units as my frequency does. And so this is often an excellent approximation, except for that little issue there. Um, we could also consider other situations just to see that it is, in fact, a little more general than what I've illustrated here. We could consider an LCR circuit in electronics. <clears throat> let's see. So let's make a circuit. So I've got a circuit with a capacitor, a resistor, and an inductor. And I'm considering charge there, charge on the capacitor, and whatever current we get out of that. Okay. So let's see. We know that 
the voltage on the inductor is just L di by dt. That is L q double dot. The voltage on the capacitor, sorry, voltage on the capacitor, Q equals C times V, so that's just Q divided by the capacitance. The voltage on the resistor is just Ohm's law, which is Q dot times R. Q dot is just I. Q is like X here. Q is my variable that's going through the sinusoidal variation. Q dot is then like the velocity. And so we have a voltage, a restoring force if you like, that's proportional to the analog of the velocity. So this will be exactly analogous uh, to this, with vo forces becoming voltages. Well, it's called electromotive force. Uh, and position being replaced by the charge. So we can uh, try playing with that. Thing there, do the same thing there, I hope. Maybe. Right, oh, I gotta do that and then that. Too many buttons. Okay, we just see a scope trace. Yeah, because everything's off. So I have my capacitor, my inductor. And I can adjust resistors. There's already some resistance in this inductor. So I turn on my square wave. Um, so the red is the voltage across the capacitor. So that's the direct analog of position. So that's Q, basically. I mean, that's all. So I'm just looking at the vo this voltage, which is just basically Q with a proportionality factor of C. The, the um, yellow curve is the voltage across the inductor. Uh, and one thing we can see is that uh, when, is, is that these voltages are, are out of phase, quite out of phase. That's, that's this business of things sloshing back and forth between the two. Um, but the yellow is a little more complicated because the yellow is basically Q double dot. Of course, if you take a sign and you take a double dot of that, you get minus a sign. So that makes sense. But uh, I want to focus mostly on the red one, the voltage across the capacitor. Uh, we see it's damping out. You know, it's decreasing from from where it was, even though I have zero resistance in here. That's just because there's resistance on, on the inductor. Uh, but I can add some additional resistance and you can see what happens. So I've added 500 ohms there, 1500 ohms, 2500, 3500. So, so the, the, so, you still see some oscillation. So just look at the red. The yellow is complicated because it's Q double dot and we have a source actually here with that square wave. So it's responding to the very, the immediate change in the voltage there and, and, uh, and that's not the regime I want to look at. It's looking at something else. 
I want to just look at the, uh, um, at the smooth response. And you can see that if I turn this high enough, the red curve no longer oscillates. It just starts at some voltage and then asymptotically just decreases to zero, that where it's at the bottom is zero, okay? Um, and I can turn it back on and see the sine wave again. I can see it go to zero and, and, and I can even go farther. It just gets a longer and longer kind of tail as I increase the resistance farther here. So you can think in terms of time constants, you know about time constants. Okay, so we're going to have to think about that some too. Um, so what is going to be the equation that's going to govern this? So let's go back to the damped spring. Although I assert I could write down exactly the same equation just with redefining symbols a little bit for this LCR circuit that I just, for the voltage across the capacitor, say, or the charge on the capacitor. <coughs> um, so we have M times x double dot, so from Newton's law, equals minus kx minus gamma m x dot, where I've now put in the force from the damping. Well, I can write this as x double dot plus gamma x dot plus omega naught squared x is equal to zero. <coughs> So with gamma was zero, we'd recover our earlier equation. <coughs> what is this? Well, it's still a second order linear different homogeneous uh, differential equation. Second order linear homogeneous differential equation. Just like it was without the gamma there, we've just added a term proportion to the velocity. So what's the solution to that equation going to look like? Well, we've already seen, I mean, we, here's, there's a graph of the solution, okay? So as a function of time, we expect x to be, well, what? <coughs> so x is a function of time. Uh, some initial condition, maybe up here. And then some sinusoidal variation that dies out with time. And maybe it dies out with time. So it's gonna so if I draw an envelope through the peaks through the peaks of this, uh, we see, well, you know, maybe it's some kind of exponential decay. And so maybe we have an exponential times the sinusoid. It's kind of what it looks like. What's the frequency of this? Well, we have a well-defined frequency in this thing. That's our natural frequency of the oscillator. which is by definition k over m. Is that the frequency? Well, I don't know. It's a good first guess. But it's not quite the same system as, we, as without the damping, so who knows. 
We have to figure it out. <coughs> um, let's complicate the, the issue now. Let's do something else. It's, it's maybe a little boring to just uh, you know, push the push the uh, <coughs> push this aside, and no, I'm in trouble. I've got to, oh, it's really off now. Okay, <coughs> fortunately, I've got a backup plan. So I have another mass on a spring here. Okay, it's under gravity, but to, so you know that's the same equations of motion. And I've got basically a speaker coil that drives it. So, okay, so we can get some motion there. So this driving is very small amplitude driving here, you see. It, it, but it's, it's moving up and down according to a sinusoid. And you can see the motion of the, of the mass of the spring is actually quite a bit bigger than this motion. So the, somehow it's getting amplified. Uh, let's see, I could go, uh, I mean, of course, if I go very fast, So this is, hard to tell it's moving. And the mass is not, not really moving. So if I go really fast, it doesn't look like it's moving at all. Now, I know why that wasn't working. But you still can't see anything. You can, you can kind of feel that it's moving. But the mass is basically not moving. So if I go really fast with my driving force, it's basically not moving. Let me go. And if I go really slow, it's got some motion here from, the trouble is the, the transient motion is hard to damp out. So now, When it's too slow to be able to tell it's moving. Well, let's go to where we can see things happening. I'm getting tired of not seeing anything happen. So this is very close to one hertz here. <clears throat> and now the motion's pretty big. In the limit of zero frequency, that will move just like this moves. It'll be like it's just attached to it and following it. At a limit of very high frequency, this is moving so fast that the spring just doesn't have time to respond. And again, the amplitude will go to zero. But here I'm in a region where I'm kind of tuned to omega naught. And so it's, it's got very large oscillations. <coughs> and I... If I had some air, I could show you that on that as well. Um, we can maybe see it on this too. If I remember how to. <coughs> okay, so I can, so right now this is at uh, 100 hertz. Is that? Um, so I can increase the frequency. 
let me uh, go to there. 200. So look, look at the, um, look at the red curve. Oh, it's clipping. Yeah, look at the red curve. Let me see. Look at the red curve. <laughs> That's not supposed to happen. Let's see. This thing is doing bad things to me. Okay, we got a square wave back. Maybe we can't show it with us. The problem is uh, staying on the same scale. There's a funny behavior. So the red curve is actually the difference between two different voltages. Uh, and it's not doing what I wanted it to do. Maybe I'll come back to it next time. OK. <clears throat> I'll figure out what's wrong. <clears throat> Let's just try to solve for the motion. So what I want to do is complicate the problem. So I'm going to put a driving force on. <clears throat> I'm going to put a force that's a function of time that say as that phase, okay? Oh, I know what I did wrong. I can show it to you. I wanted to show you a driving force, right? I want a driving force that looks like this. So the green is the driving force. Now I've got a sine wave instead of a square wave. <clears throat> so now I can change the frequency. Ooh, it's starting to get big. You know, I start, okay, so forget that. But, the, uh, you know, it, it, it starts, that's because the red is the difference of two voltages somehow, and it's, 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 uh, it's clipping. Um, but uh, it really does a funny thing. It's, it's because, you know, it's a digital effect. But I wanted to get... Let me go to a lower frequency so I can tell what I'm doing. <laughs> I'll never get back to where I was. There we go. Now we're back. OK. Maybe I should have told you to look at the yellow one. But, um, <clears throat> So you can see that if I adjust the scale, so this is a pretty low frequency. I'll, I'll make it even flatter. You know, not much is happening for a while, but as I increase the frequency, you can certainly see the yellow, the yellow one's getting big, and then all of a sudden the red one goes haywire too. It's got a digital effect in there that's unfortunate, but uh, 
Now I've uh, this thing has uh, some features I don't like here. I clearly should have practiced this a little bit more. Well, you saw the you saw the effect. If, as I went up in the frequency, the voltage start, the, st started to blow up. It, you can see it best on the yellow. The red doesn't work that well. Uh, I'm not going to waste too much time on it. Okay. <coughs> so, what's going to happen here? Our differential equation becomes <coughs> becomes this. Of course, this omega is anything we choose. I was able to dial it here. It has nothing to do with omega naught. <coughs> Where, if you like, uh, a naught is here. I've just taken this f naught and divided it by m to get rid of the m's here. Okay. So we expect that the motion is going to be oscillatory. I mean, that looks oscillatory. <coughs> um, at what frequency? Well, since the driving force is that frequency omega, after we let the damping do its work and all the transient motion dying down, it's probably going to be an omega. Because that's the only frequency that's, that's in there for, for long times. And, and the question is, is that right? So let's try to solve for this motion. So the general solution is just a second order, now inhomogeneous differential equation, linear still. The general solution will be the general solution to the homogeneous problem so you f you find the general solution to this homogeneous problem and then you add to that you take the force free problem and then you add a particular solution <coughs> to the inhomogeneous problem. So that's a general strategy for, for solving these differential equations. There will be two integration constants. because it's a second order differential equation. And these will be fixed by the boundary conditions or, or the initial conditions. The boundary conditions. OK, so let's carry out this exercise. Let's start with the homogeneous equation. x double dot plus gamma x dot plus omega naught squared x is equal to zero. <clears throat> what do we do? Well, we have a kind of a guess for the solution. We have that as a guess. It's maybe an exponential times a sinusoid. <clears throat> but we can write sines and cosines as exponentials, too. 
e to the i x is uh, just uh, <coughs> cosine x plus i sine x. <coughs> so maybe just try just try an exponential to this. Try an exponential solution. <coughs> So the, I mean, of course, the point here is that, you know, we don't necessarily have to do anything fancy if we can guess the solution. So let's, in this case, we probably can. So let's try x of t is equal to e to some constant times time. So let's see. So we need to get x dot. x dot is a times x x double dot is a squared times x. And so let's plug that into the differential equation. <coughs> we can divide out the x, and we get a squared plus gamma a plus omega naught squared is equal to 0. So, okay, um, that's just a quadratic equation in A. So that means that A is equal to minus gamma over 2 plus or minus <coughs> the square root of gamma over 2 squared <coughs> minus omega naught squared. I've already divided by the 2 here. <coughs> And, and so this is my two linearly independent solutions. <clears throat> Unless omega naught is equal to gamma over 2. In which case that's 0 and uh, something's going on there okay, that I have to worry about. Uh, anyway, let's plug ahead for the moment. Let's define omega 1 squared to be omega naught squared minus gamma squared over 4, thinking about what's inside that bracket, which has frequency units. And so then A is equal to minus gamma over 2 <coughs> plus or minus I times omega 1. As you see, I put the minus sign the other way on here. <coughs> So that's looking like if I take this, you know, I'm going to take e to the at, so I'm going to get a term that's a damping kind of term that's exponentially falling. And then with this piece, I'm going to get something if omega 1 is a real number, is uh, oscillatory. Well, that's kind of looking promising. That's kind of what I want. <coughs> Okay, we've introduced complex numbers here, so e to the at may be complex. Um, we understand here that we're going to take the real part, if that happens, we're going to take the real part of our solution to get the physical position. In fact, we don't even have to think about it because that is going to get enforced by our boundary conditions, which are going to be real. So we don't actually have to think too hard. We will get a real answer once we put in the boundary conditions, <coughs> as long as the boundary conditions are real. Um, <coughs> so let's see. <coughs> Solution. We have a solution. x of t is equal to e to the minus gamma t over 2 times a e to the i omega 1 t plus b e to the minus i omega 1 t. <clears throat> we already see that the oscillation isn't quite at omega naught. It's shifted. In fact, it's shifted lower in frequency than, than the natural frequency. The damping is dragging on the system is kind of how you look at that. It's kind of 
trying to resist the motion. It's, slow, it's slowing the frequency down. <coughs> um, okay, but we do have this case that we've got to worry about. Omega naught equals gamma over 2 implies omega 1 equals 0. One solution. We just lost a solution. <clears throat> we lost a degree of freedom in our solution space. So what do we do? Well, it means that something we did here doesn't cover this case quite right. So we have to go back to the differential equation for this case and, and see what happens. <clears throat> the differential equation is x double dot plus gamma x dot plus gamma over 2 squared x is equal to 0. <clears throat> we look for a modified solution. And it's useful just to, to divide out the, this exponential damping part. So we just look for x of t equals some constant e to the minus gamma t over 2 times some function of time. Plug that into the differential equation. There's a, can you see there? No. Plug, plug into the differential equation, x of t equals a e to the minus gamma t over 2 f of t. Just plug that in. There's a little bit of algebra, but you find that f double dot is equal to 0. It simply, the answer comes out nice and simply, and so we find that f uh, of t must be equal to um, uh, a plus bt. So that gives us the solution when, uh, when omega naught is equal to gamma over 2. We just take e to the minus gamma t over 2 times this linear Savine function, a plus bt. So that special case, we get that. Okay, so next time I'm going to summarize it. Uh, next Tuesday I may do this right. Uh, just to prove I can, but that's it for now. <laughs>